I'm just going to introduce myself. First of all, I, I'm Mark Salway. Uh, I'm the managing director of, of the uh, fundraising and management unit. In other words, the consulting uh, work at Moore Kingston Smith. And uh, I was going to say, Marcus, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Marcus Lees Millet, and I am the financial manager at Moore Kingston Smith Fundraising Management. Cool. Oh. And we both had lives in the past. In other words, we, we, we've had experience before this. And, you know, I, I used to work uh, in humanitarian aid, so I'm going to be able to share some of my experience from what it feels like to be involved in, you know, like an emergency, for example. Um, I'm also going to, to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the other things like sleep, you know, uh, which, which, are, which are interesting things, which you normally wouldn't expect from a, from a finance perspective. But let, let's go through uh, the slides that we've worked up for you. And I just, I just hope you enjoy it. Marcus, did you just want to talk about um, how we're going to mute and unmute people? To, to sure. Them? Yeah. So just to try and do a bit of um, kind of uh, housekeeping for this, we're going to, rather than unmuting people when we want them to, to talk, given people may have bad connections or background noise, et cetera, and it's just easier to manage. Um, throughout the um, throughout the presentation, no doubt you'll have some questions. And if you have any, I think the best way to do that is we're going to use the chat box. So hopefully you should all be able to see at the bottom of your screen a, um, a series of buttons, one of which looks like a text message icon, and it's called chat. And if you click into that button and then type into that, that will send a chat to everyone who is a presenter within the webinar. So there are a few of us on here. We've got the rest of our team also logged in here. So we've got some impact specialists, some fundraising specialists. So if your question doesn't necessarily relate to finance, that's still fine. We've got someone who can help with that. And we will, rather than answering questions as we go, I think we're going to try and run through the the whole webinar and then at the end we'll do a do a Q&A. So if you have any questions as we go through, do type them into the chat box. We will be keeping a note of them and we will try and answer them at the end. If for whatever reason we don't get to any of your questions, we will be sending a follow-up email early next week probably given it's now the um going to be the Easter holiday weekend. Uh, so early next week we'll send an email around to to everyone who participated in this, including um, a summary of the Q&A and any of the additional questions that people asked with answers to them. So that, that's great. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick us off um, by saying this is not business as usual. Yeah. Um, when, when I was uh, working in humanitarian aid, the first uh, response or emergency response I was involved in was Haiti. Uh, Haiti, uh, it was the city, the the size of Brighton. So in other words, the number of people in Brighton were killed in seven seconds and the same number were, were injured. And it was, a, it was just a, you know, incredible, uh, the, the sudden, sudden like sort of jolt. And you had to respond as an organization. What, what we found was for the first you know, week or two weeks worth of response, we were just doing things, but we really didn't have that much of you know, a coordinated plan until the UN agencies had come around and, and really started to, to engage. And also the NGOs really started talking to each other. And so sit reps, situation reps were important. You know, seven days, uh, six days into it, we got, you know, really solid situation reps, which we can start to take decisions from. And that's what it's kind of been like, um, you know, with the uh, coronavirus uh, response. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a trustee of uh, two other charities. I also run a very large swimming club, 32, uh, you know, uh, staff, well, I, I, I used to run it, but I, I, I'm now involved in the board and just taking some of these decisions. I want to share from a finance lens and from a finance point of view, uh, what that might feel like. So, so just, um, you know, going through a couple of the slides here, just, just to kick us off, um, what we're going to talk about uh, is probably 35 minutes, 40 minutes worth of, of talk. We're going to have 20, 25 minutes worth of questions. I'm going to give you some general thoughts. Uh, we, Marcus is going to talk through some technical aspects. We're going to talk through finance in general and how finance needs to step up. Um, and then the fourth thing is just how to survive it, you know, personally. And then we're going to come around to what's on the horizon, uh, other webinars, other uh, you know, seminars that we're running, because as a group of practitioners all having worked in charities before, we just want to do something. So this is a weekly webinar series we're putting on to, to help people to think. And also, uh, for example, we're offering 30 minute, uh, you know, free consultations. Just if anybody wants to come and bring any problems to us around finance or fundraising or, or, or impact. Um, 
a little bit about more Kingston Smith. Um, you know, year on year, we, we, we seem to be, uh, you know, regarded very highly for our charity expertise, you know, because we're all, if you like, sort of people that have worked in charities before, we really understand uh, over 700 charity clients, 14 charity specialist part, uh, partners, and also part of the more global network. So we have an international, you know, reach. Um, uh, coming down to the team that I, I run, we've really got three different angles to the team. Um, you know, we've got an impact lens, you know, which is around impact measurement, uh, predictive modeling, strategic decision making. In other words, how do you put impact at the heart of your strategy? And um, especially at the moment, you may want to go back to some of your stakeholders, some of the beneficiaries, some of the people that you work for and um, ask them the question. How are, you, how are we doing in our response? You know, what, what is the impact of the coronavirus work that we're doing? So I think impact is, is really hard um, to think about sometimes when you're thinking so much about money, but why do we exist? We, we don't exist for the money, we exist to make change in people's lives. Yeah? So, so impact has to be at the heart of everything we do. The finance team, Marcus and myself, um, you know, we link into a much broader um, set of finance specialists and other consultants within MKS, but we do good financial management. We, we do a lot of uh, cost recovery, business model reviews, finance function reviews. That's our area. And then in terms of fundraising, you know, Emma and, and Dan, uh, strategic fundraising advice. Uh, and last week, I think we had 180 people on the call to, to hear Dan talk about how do you write good bids in the current climate for coronavirus support? Um, so let's get into the webinar proper. I, I want to I want to start by saying you, you've got two different lenses going on at the moment, two two different things going on. You've got the inside uh, organisation and you've got the outside organisation. So you know internal within the organisation, you're having to manage employees. Are we furloughing? Or are we not furloughing? You know, how do we keep down costs? You know, how, how, for example, do we support the organization to have the core that we need, but do that in a, in a, in a sensitive way in terms of our cash, et cetera. Volunteers, you know, how do we simulate and help volunteers to step up to enable and, and help us? A big part of, of any response at the moment. And of course, service delivery, many of the services that we provide just can't be done in this environment at the moment with coronavirus especially, for example, with older people, with face-to-face, -face, with, with day centers and day clubs. You just can't bring people together in, in that way. Fundraising and funding has become absolutely critical, therefore, in this mix. And, you know, fundraising, the innovation, um, you know, we're, we're talking about potentially 48% drop-off in terms of fundraising. Um, that is pretty profound. How, how are fundraisers and, and how are we going to innovate as the sector to actually meet that that gap it's going to come down to business models it's going to come down to actually really understanding um how you match off your income and your costs and and also use your reserves to balance that out and, and we're going to we're going to talk about that um on the flip side you've got increased demand healthcare, unemployment mental health social isolation this is what we exist for and so i want to stop here and just say thank you to everybody on the call because you know, finance and support functions, we don't get a lot of applause sometimes, but we are making sure that actually organizations survive and can deliver what beneficiaries and clients really need at the moment. But, but I want to say this, it's not business, business as usual, yeah, and it won't be for some time. The latest uh, Charity Finance Group Institute of Fundraising NCVO survey said we've got a 42% increase in demand, you know, for our services matched off with a 48% decline in voluntary income. 84% um, of all charities said they could respond to coronavirus if only there was existing or if only there was government funding. And 83% of charities are now worried about their funding. So, so the finance lens is particularly powerful. But don't forget, finance is, is, is not everything. It's impact which which really matters and it's what we do to actually help the clients and the beneficiaries which which, which matters in in this um what's the response been so far like we've seen a lot of informal volunteering coordinated schemes new pots of money and then yesterday 
a 750 million pound announcement from the government to support charities. I mean, 350 million of that is going to go to small local charities. 400 million um, will go to other larger charities, organizations like St. John's Ambulance, Cancer Research UK, those that are stepping up, if you like, to, to help. But there will also be other funding across the piece for charities. But it's sector commentators are saying that actually, even from the drop off in fundraising, it's going to be 4.2 billion that is going to be lost in terms of fundraising income this year. 750 million against that is uh, actually, you know, a large chunk, but, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. And that's the context you now find yourself in as charities, you know, and, and responding, for example, to that CAF put up an emergency loan fund, 5,000 charities applied to that in, I think it was two or three days. So, so there's a scarcity of resource. There's an increased demand for services. What are you going to do? So, so this is, this is then the 10 hacks which uh, I pulled together, I, I pulled together actually these hacks about two years ago, three years ago at the business school. I just hope, I hope you enjoy them as we, as we go through. And I, I'd love for you to type into the box and, you know, just, just share some of your thoughts as, as we go forward. So, so the first thing is when you are in, for example, I talked about humanitarian aid. I, I've also worked for the Ethnic Minority Foundation, which was badly failing. When, when everything is going crazy around you and, and, and you know, there's, there's quite a lot of, you know, chaos, if you like, in, in the early days before it settled down and, and it settles down and you, you decide on a direction, you've really got to focus and prioritize. And, and I've used this word ruthlessly because there's all of the projects that we try to do when we've got spare capacity. I'm going to call them pet projects. Um, and there's non-critical work that we do. And so, so being able to say, you know, we're going we're gonna to stop some of the work that we do to give ourselves breathing space is, is incredibly important. Um, I've talked about business as usual. Well, in, in uh, the humanitarian response in, in uh, you know, Nargis, which was, you know, in Myanmar, we actually built two organizations. So one organization was dealing with business as usual and, and if you like, sort of, you know, coming and, and managing the services, the other was stepping into evolution. And, and what, we, what we tend to find in, in our consulting work, you know, at MKS is organizations come with one of two platforms. They either come, they're worried about their survival and they're asked, how do they survive? Or, 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 or on the flip side, they've got the survival and, and if you like, their sustainability nailed down. They just want to understand how to evolve. So on the right hand side here, I've given you a, a simple grid and Marcus and myself have, have mapped this out so that you can actually start to map out the impact and the profitability of, of services. Um, when you have something in the bottom left hand corner here, which is low impact and low profitability or doesn't really generate very many much surplus yeah you really should at this time be saying actually can we afford to do this yeah people will hold on to things because they think it's important but if it's if it's low impact and it's low you know profitability you, you have to ask you know that th there may be better things to focus on equally if you've got if you've got those things that are very high impact and high profitability those are the things that you've got to hold on to or are making a really good surplus that's where you want to push into but, but the thing is, you can't just leave them. You have to manage them and put investment into them and help them to, you know, be, uh, you know, bigger. And, and that may be needing the coronavirus world to actually uh, think, you know, broader than that, maybe to evolve some of your services, um, you know, to change them for the coronavirus environment. Um, in the top left-hand corner, you've got high impact, but, but it doesn't really create a lot of profit. Keeping costs down here are, are, are critical. Can you partner with other people? For example, you know, in humanitarian aid, you're always partnering with others and, and, and sometimes with the army, for example, because it gives you a cadre of people that are all trying to save the same, solve the same problem, which you can spread your cost base across. Um, but equally, cost recovery becomes very important. Can you do things and charge for them effectively so that you get the money to, to cover your work? On the, on the flip side, where you have something which is very high uh, in terms of profit, but low in terms of impact, that's really interesting. It, it's where, for example, organizations start to say, we're becoming too commercial. 
yeah but i think at the moment in this environment um you know if you if you're able to provide funding in that area great drive forward on that if 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 you can but be sensitive to the fact that actually being a not-for-profit and focused on impact, great sometimes against the much more commercial type services. And as you as you go through this grid, it, it kind of feels as if you'll rub into my, my hack number two, which is really having open and robust conversations. Um, it's 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 funny. Uh, you, you're going to need situ situation reps. You're going to need those those situation reports from each and every part of the business um, to be able to see what's going on the speed of decision making from trustees needs to be much faster um you're going to have to challenge uh, the information that you're 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 given and give everyone a voice there is no such thing as a stupid question and what i what i found really interesting was you know there was a a colleague of mine who asked something this was about 10 years ago about safeguarding um, and he asked a stupid question saying, do we have a safeguarding issue? Do you think the sector is, is, is doing well in terms of safeguarding? We said, oh, it's fine. If we'd have just thought about that question and really, you know, asked stupid questions around it and dug into it, it maybe would have, would have like sort of, you know, put, I think, you know, the sector in maybe a different place. So here's the thing, you know, with, with coronavirus and safeguarding, are you starting to think about, you know, vulnerable children, vulnerable adults, and and you know the potential impact. I'm sure I'm sure you are, but it's a it's a stupid question I'm asking, yeah. Um. And then when you're actually responding, fail fast, pivot, try again, keep listening and learning, yeah. If something isn't working, change it. But at some point in time, you're going to have to find a direction that you're going to move in. And then you've got to get behind that direction, but 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 also be flexible enough and agile enough to be able to to change as as you you go forward. So those are some general thoughts. I mean, Marcus, um, you know, passing over to you now in a much more technical, financy type way. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So thanks, Mark. Um, on to the next page here. We're talking about some of the more technical aspects of um, things that you can can do your in the 10 hacks to try and improve in the current environment and the number four point there cash is king now that's an often often said idiom as it were but what do we actually really mean by that um, and I suppose this is about saying it's all well and good having you know the, the biggest most successful organization ever but if you have no cash to be able to pay your bills when they come in then you're you're going to be fairly stuffed and so cash really is what often drives us as as organizations financially and and keeping on top of cash flow in the in this current environment is going to be more important than ever um, the big the biggest cost to almost all of our organizations is going to be people um, and so getting on top of what your salary payments are going to be um, coming up in the future and knowing when those payments are going to be going out so that you know you have enough cash for at the end of each month, say, when you're making your salary payments is is vital. The, the money you've got coming in compared to those payments going out um, from grants, contracts, fundraising is going to be coming from a whole host of different sources. But those are all likely to be on different cycles that it's not going to be a straightforward monthly um, income amount from those in the same way that your expenditure for paying your salaries might be. Um, and so knowing the, the intricacies of your cash balance and, and what your outgoings versus what your incomings are is really, really important, um, particularly with things like grants and contracts where, you know, grants you may be used to being paid in advance. Whereas with the switch to contracts, people are more often being paid in arrears, and that's having having real uh, difficulty with cash flow, which we'll come to later with working capital. Um, but can you go back to those funders and say, actually, to try and keep on top of our cash flow, to to make sure that we're in a cash healthy position as an organisation? Can we be paid in advance? Can we get a um an advance um, before starting this work to make sure that we can pay to do it? Um, and things like that. And going back to what I just said before about working capital, um, what I mean by that is the time it takes from starting a piece of work to when the money comes into the bank. And this is often underestimated where you go, oh, it's great, we're um, 
taking on a new piece of work, it's going to pay pay millions and millions. We're, we're going to be set for life here. But if you only get paid that at the end of the piece of work, that piece of work might take a year, two years to complete. And you only see the money at the end there. And so your working capital cycle there is something to really um, be aware of, because all that while you're going to have to be paying costs for that service or project. You're going to still be paying the staff salaries, et cetera, but you're not getting the income. So as an organization, are you aware of your working capital cycle for your different services? Are you aware of when your major upcoming outgoings are and when you're likely to be getting income to, to offset against that? And most often when people build budgets, it's normally seen as a, okay, we know we get 200,000 worth of income, divide that by 12, and that's what we're getting each month. But as I've said before, with those grants, contracts, and fundraising, it's it's not a simple monthly um, monthly income. You might be getting different amounts in different times. If you do a Christmas fundraising appeal, you're going to get far more income in Christmas than you will in January, when everyone's pockets are feeling a little bit, little bit emptier, and so giving might be less high. In a similar way, your expenditure is not going to be flat throughout the entire year, or it's very unlikely to be for most organizations. If you're a, um, a charity that does a, some, some gardening services for the elderly, say, you're not going to be doing much of that work during Christmas time. So being aware of when your income is coming in and when your costs are going to be um, going up and down and the uh, the peaks and troughs of your cash flow are, are really, really important. Next up, we've got knowing your margins and knowing your costs. Now, this slightly ties in from to, to the cash element of if you're knowing what costs you've got coming out at different times, that suggests you have a better, better grip on what, what your costs are likely to be for your different services. But particularly at times like this, when, um, as Mark has said, there's likely to be a 48% drop in voluntary um, income, keeping on top of your costs is really, really vital. Um, do you know what it really costs you to run your different services? And can you say with clarity whether your services make a surplus or a deficit once you take into account your overheads? Because going back to um, the previous slide where we had that diagram of impact versus profitability, if you don't know what the profitability of your service is, then how are you going to be able to have that robust challenge, that robust discussion about what you want to be um, changing in the future if you don't know um, all of the information? And within cost recovery, what about cost recovery? Um, I think cost recovery is the easiest way as an organization that you can get more money. And one of the ways that we would recommend that is by simply using a template when putting in for bids or contracts, et cetera, that so many organizations leave out five to 10% of their costs because they simply forget about them and don't include them. And if you haven't included them, there's no way you're gonna get funding for them. Um, and so I'd suggest using a template where you put down all the different costs your organization has, and then use that to fill out for each particular service, um, what costs you're, you potentially have. Can I, can I just make a quick comment there, Marcus, yeah? Sure. Um, because one, one of the things that I, I really worry about at the moment, um, you know, for, for charities, is, is if you've got a service or you've got a contract and you're spending, you, you've got a cost recovery that you're taking with that. Well, actually, if you're pushing out the amount of time that you're taking for your grant or mm. your contract, your cost recovery is, is just stretched over that. So, so do you still just get a percentage? That's going to look pretty naked against your, your, your costs. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, you know, we, we found is going back to donors and, you know, uh, personally, I've been back to, you know, when I was working in one charity before I went to back to 19 donors to actually, you know, re, re um, assess that and to look at the amount of cost recovery we were getting for, um, you know, our grants and our bids. That's the thing that really worries me at the moment, just getting on top of that nuance of how much you get in terms of cost recovery for your grants and your contracts. Sorry, Marcus, I thought I'd make it a bit more. No, no. Yeah, yeah, it was just, just really important. Um, equally in there, talking about cost recovery, that if you're going with a flat percentage and you know that a donor will only give 5%, say, um, on, on a particular project, that, that might be a much smaller percentage than your um, overheads actually are. But revisiting those overheads and really challenging 
what you're classifying as overheads and why can be a very valuable exercise. So as an example, most organizations would, would simply put buildings uh, as an overhead. But if you're using that building to run part of your service out of, if your building is um, housing a tea room, say, or something like that, that links to some of the work that you do, then surely that is not simply an overhead, that is part of your service delivery costs and should be included as such. And so by revisiting and challenging your overheads as you traditionally see them and really pushing yourself to go, okay, what of these can we actually link to the work that we do? You um, may be able to drive down that percentage of your overheads and move more and more cost into your actual service delivery costs um, and therefore have a better chance of, of getting your overhead percentage recovered. But once you've got that um, idea of what your overheads are, as, as we say at the bottom there, where are you subsidizing services or losses? So really keeping track of the, the income, the profitability or the surplus generation of your different services, and equally the ones that are making deficits to be able to then revisit them and challenge yourselves and say, okay, what services are we doing and why? Are these services making money, losing money? If they're losing money, can we do them differently to to um to change that? Do we need to keep doing this service if it's losing money? Can we fund it from somewhere else? Um, and things like that. You simply can't have those robust conversations if you don't know your margins and your costs to begin with. Tying into that and talking about um, margins and costs and and getting data and information. seem to have just become muted there. Tying in to um, talking about your, your margins and, and your costs and getting data into the hands of those making decisions is management information. Um, and the average time in the, in the charity sector that, that Mark and I have found from our work is, is three to five weeks. Whereas in the business world, it's three to five days. And being able to get that information in a timely manner means that when management are making decisions using that information, they're using up-to-date information, they're using current data rather than something that may be over a month old, which particularly in the current um, fast-changing climate. A month ago, we were in a very different position to what we are now. Um, and so getting that information in a timely manner is the single biggest thing that you can change about your management information, getting a fast close. And that bottom bit there that says good enough, one of the main things you can do to help with getting timely management information is to ensure, rather than trying to ensure that you have 100% of all your data captured before you prepare your management information, if you've got 95, 98% of that data in there and you're just missing a, you know, a couple of pounds here and there, that's good enough. That's good enough to be basing decisions off. That's good enough to be um, informing those in management. And so chasing around those two pounds is not going to create uh, an immeasurable amount of value more in that information. So it's probably not worth doing. The first point there about management information is the most important though, forward looking. If your management information is always looking back at what last month was versus actual, what, um, what last year's data was, but nothing about what's coming forward, then you're driving your organization in the rearview mirror. By being forward looking, you have an idea of what's coming up ahead and how you're going to react to that, how you're going to challenge in this current current environment, how you're going to challenge the organization to, to adapt, to evolve and survive and thrive. And that forward looking information should be, be revisited. You have your annual forecast. You should be revisiting that forecast two or three times a year to, to be saying, is this still accurate? Is this still current? Um, do we need to update it? And as I say there, financial and non-financial information. If your management information is just a heap of numbers, it's, go it's gonna be fairly meaningless to most of the people trying to, trying to look at it. And so having management information sitting with more than just finance is really important. So you want your budget holders for your different services to be involved in this so that when you can say, oh, okay, the um, expenditure for this service has gone up by 10%, finance aren't going to be able to tell you why that may be but if you're preparing this with those service managers with those service directors they can give you information go ah yes those costs have gone up by 10 percent but if you look at the number of people we've reached 
that's also gone up by 20%. So we've actually done better. This isn't a, a bad change, it's, it's a good change. Um, and so combining financial and non-financial information really helps you to be able to tell a story with that management information and makes the numbers that much more useful than just numbers alone. So now talking about finance in general here, we're saying that finance needs to step up now more than ever. Um, this graph on the right shows a diagram of, um, uh, of typical uh, finance function and the, the different levels within it. So at the bottom you have transaction processing that largely takes up a lot of um, an organization's time, just processing income expenditure, et cetera, as it comes in. Above that, you've got the controls that ensure the um, the accuracy of the different transactions that you're recording, making sure you're not paying money to the wrong place, uh, making sure that someone can't go in and edit your payroll, et cetera, et cetera. Above that, you've got reporting, and as we've just been covering, management information, which is increasingly important at the moment. And then at the top, the financial strategy, the uh, making the the key decisions at your organization, what services are we starting, stopping, uh, what's the general direction of our, of our organization. And we're saying here that finance is more than simply transaction processing. So those bottom two sections, transaction processing and control environment, you can see from that triangle, take up the vast majority of time of finance. But it's about trying to make sure that you can free up finances time to spend more time doing the value add activities so that they can be preparing better management information on a more timely basis so that they can be having more time to be involved in the the financial strategy of the organization to be more of a business partner to the rest of the organization offering support with um with writing bids and setting budgets and that sort of thing and one way to try and do this is to reduce that time spent on the transaction processing and control environment. Um, and so often we're um, seeing organizations where they use a system that is not really a system. It's a series of spreadsheets. Um, I think we found that the average was between 15 and 17 spreadsheets being used uh, as an organization from which to prepare their management information. And um, a, an ex-colleague of ours would always describe it as spreadsheet city. And by moving information between these different spreadsheets, every time you're having to re-key that information, two to three percent of what you enter is likely to be incorrect. And it also takes more and more time every time you're having to do that. So by trying to use a um, easy to use intuitive financial system, you can potentially save yourselves a good amount of time while also ensuring that actually your figures are going to be more accurate as well. Um, but the biggest thing that uh, that Mark and I have found to try and streamline processing and, con and the controls environment is to look at your purchase order sign-off process. And simply signing off a purchase order before you make a purchase um, can be invaluable as an organization. It gives finance clarity and visibility of upcoming um, transactions that are going to be coming up so that when they do come in, Finance aren't having to chase around and go. This cost, this invoice has arrived on my desk. Who's it for? What? What is it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You've got a purchase order that links to that. You can go back to the purchase order, see that it's been approved, know what it relates to, um, and then you don't even need to necessarily get more approval before you pay because you already have that approval sat within the purchase order. And by doing that, you can save organ save time within your organization, but also ensure that you're um, actually keeping track of your uh, your payables in a better manner because you know what's coming up. Um, next, we're going to talk about your reserves policy. And the first thing I would say is, is what is your charity's reserve policy? That most charities, I think, at the moment, um, use what used to be the Charity Commission's guidance, which was to use between three to six months of um, annual running costs uh, as a sort of closure basis. But in actual fact, as charities, almost all of us are going concerned. And so having our reserves policy sat on a, on a closure basis doesn't necessarily make the best sense. Um, and the Charity Commission has updated their guidance since then. It just hasn't quite seemingly filtered through into being um, undertaken by most charities. 
and their guidance has been updated to say that actually your reserves policy should be based on a risk base basis. What are the risks facing your organization, um, such as loss of income in this current climate, uh, unexpected costs of redundancy costs or having to furlough staff, that sort of thing, um, e extensions to your working capital cycle. And so by using these bases, um, you may be able to find that actually what you need as a reserves level to to um, mitigate those risks might actually be less than the the six months um, running cost that you're currently trying to hold and free up some of those reserves. Um, but when we talk about freeing up reserves, I suppose the question is, what are free reserves? So it's all well and good saying you have um, reserves of a million pounds, but if all of those reserves are tied up in a property, then you can't actually access them to, to use them to, um, to pay for things as and when you need. Um, and so free reserves are uh, cash or other liquid assets um, that are unrestricted funds that can be freely and readily used to, to pay for things as and when you need. Um, and I would say that a lot of people seem to regard reserves as being a rainy day fund. And um, as Mark and I were talking earlier, he said, well, it's currently it's doing more than raining. It's, it's bloody pouring um, in the charity space right now. And so actually now may be a good time to review your reserves policy, look at what you really need and potentially can you free up some of those reserves to be able to spend them as and when you need them. And linking into that is saying, OK, well, what are your restricted versus your unrestricted reserves? And can you use restricted funds in another way? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hand you back to, to Mark, who has a, a, a funny and often told black and white cat story to illustrate uh, the use of restricted funds. Thank, thank you. Uh, and I mean, you know, Marcus and myself in preparing for this, and we were bouncing ideas backwards and forwards. And, and Marcus said to me, well, you know, give me, give me three ways that you can use, um, you know, your restricted funds in a, in a different way. And, and so I, 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 I um, you know, wanted to actually help you. I'll tell the story at the end of it. Um, but, the, but the first thing here is, you know, better recharge of costs, um, you know, into your grants, into your contracts, you know, into how you're actually paying for things can, can free up money. So, so back to what Marcus was saying about, you know, cost recovery before, if you get your recharging right, typically there mm -hmm. might be 5% to 10%, you know, more to your, to your organization off the back of that. Yeah. Um, the second, the second thing is interesting. Let's, let's talk about legacies. Um, you know, when I was working at Cats Protection, we used to have 32 million pounds worth of legacies. Now it's about 50 million worth of legacies. And if the legacy says it's my wish or my will um, that we would use that for cats in Brighton, for example, that's not a strong enough restriction. It's, it's more unrestricted funds. Whereas if the legacy, for example, said it's my last will and testament that this money shall be used in Brighton and in no other way or no other purpose, that's pretty much restricted. So, so I, I really think there's, there's a lot of scope to go back and challenge um, some of the way that funds are actually held. You, you, you really can't though, just unrestrict restricted money. And you know, the Ethnic Minority Foundation I worked for had a building. It was, uh, you know, uh, an unrestricted, sorry, a restricted asset. They, they sold the building and, and unfortunately accounted for it in a slightly incorrect way and, and then much more unrestricted reserves. Um, that got them then a, a National Audit Office investigation. Um, so, so just be careful about that. And so, so here's my black and white cat story. I'm sorry if it's, you know, many who have heard this before, but when I was working for Cats Protection, I, I was very careful to say, please raise money for cats like Scrunchy. Don't raise money for Scrunchy. In other words, Scrunchy was a cat in, in the Brighton area that, um, you know, had, had needed some, some work. Um, and so, you know, I said, please raise money for cats like Scrunchy. In, in a Sunday afternoon, we raised twelve and a half thousand pounds for the cat. Um, so what actually happened was the black and white cat then was, um, you know, with twelve and a half thousand pounds, it subsequently died. Unfortunately, it didn't it didn't make it. Um, and so we had twelve and a half thousand pounds raised for a photo fit identity of a cat with the name and the and the paw prints underneath. You could see what the cat was and, and, and what the money was for. It was restricted monies. So what we had to do in rehoming all the cats, I think the next 40 cats down in Brighton was call them all scrunchy. 
yeah, to actually use money in um, in uh, you know the the right way. In other words, as per the use of the restriction. So so being being careful with the way you actually, for example, put forward us at the moment to your donors, is is going to be really critical. I'm sorry, I really deeply apologise for anybody who's heard that story before. Um, but but the big the big thing for me is talk to your donors. Your donors really want to help you at the moment. They really want to help you to survive. Talk to them. My 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 experience from talking to donors is, it, you know, most of them really want to want to help, and especially at the moment, they're under an obligation from government to help you as organisations. Um, but sometimes, and this is where we 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 come to you know point number nine, which is Dakota tribal wi wisdom. Um, you've got to get off and you can't ride a dead horse. You know, sometimes you have to dismount. Um, you know, seeking, seeking help early, getting an external perspective can be vital. I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are consultants, you know, throughout lots of different organizations, ours, for example, getting an external perspective to help you can be vital. Um, and there might be a range of different ways that off the back of coronavirus, you, you want to respond. Some, some will be cutting costs down, some will be holding back on services, one will be, some will be using reserves in a better way, some will be, for example, um, I, I don't know, doing things differently or investing in, in, in certain, certain ways. But other times, you, know, you may need to cut costs. Um, if you're going to cut once, cut deeply, that's what I learned from you know, actually trying to help an organization to survive. We got the organization to survive, but, but it, you know, it took nine months and, and we really had to be quite um, thoughtful. If you cut and then you cut and then you cut and you do death by a thousand cuts, um, the motivational aspect on staff, seeing this moving, uh, if you like, cut by cut by cut, it's much better just to cut once and, and cut deeply. I really, I really hope that off the back of coronavirus, this isn't the space that you, you find yourself in. And the final thing is, you know, having an orderly closeout process. If you, if you feel it's going to be necessary that you've got to talk to, I don't know, somebody to help you to get your organization to survive, but it, but it really won't. Making sure that you can close out in an orderly process is, is really what, what's needed because as soon as you call in the administrators, I'm telling you it's 10 times the amount that you've got set aside in unrestricted reserves, yeah? Se secondly, when administrators, for example, come in, they will not look at any difference between unrestricted and restricted monies. It's all the same. They'll grab it all. Yeah. So, so if you, if you have money set aside for a certain purpose, that that's irrelevant. Yeah. That money will go to pay creditors, and in the first instance, there are high closeout costs. Well, well, actually, uh, some of that money could go on to actually help other charities. Um, you know, in the future. So, don't ride a dead horse. Dismount. Um, I think is incredibly important at this time, and I'm sorry for having to say that, but but it, but it is going to become important in the future as we see more charities, you know, failing, um, mergers, acquisitions. I I really hope that there is a, an increased activity there as charities actually share their 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 work and their back office. Um, just before we go on to the final point, though, I I, I think I, I'm optimistic, yeah, um, and I'm optimistic because. In the charity sector, we, we, we've always managed to do things on, on with very little money. We've always managed to do things in an innovative way. And I, and I think that innovation and what coronavirus has done is prompt us in terms of our thinking. I think we will come out stronger. I think that um, you know a lot of charities that Marcus, myself and others in the team have worked with have old products at the end of their cycle. Um, we've been working, for example, with, with YCARE to look at new products which will, will enable them to have more impact with their, their beneficiaries. And so the bit of me that's optimistic is we'll spend more on our infrastructure, we'll have a different way of working, remote working will, will now be part of the way, that, and, and also we'll think differently about the way that we help beneficiaries and have impact at the heart of our organizations. So, so the final one really from me is energy, resilience, staff well-being, keeping in touch. Um, the difficult times are likely to, con to continue. You've got to have your energy and you've got to look after yourselves. I mean, you know, getting enough sleep is incredibly important. Um, I, I tend to use a, uh, an app. Uh, it's called Calm. Um, I used an app before called Headspace. And they just enable you to meditate and, and to get back to sleep. 
Um, I'm also, you know, very, very focused on keeping a, a constant um, so that I actually stop working about, you know, let's say an hour before I go to sleep because then my mind can wind down. And if you read all of the sleep books, um, it says that actually reading uh, another type of book for six minutes, um, something that you're interested in before you sleep is the best way to actually switch your mind off from work. Yeah. So we've we've taken you through 10 hacks pretty quickly. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's been a roller coaster ride. I, I hope you've enjoyed, you know, listening to Marcus and myself. It's now time for, you know, you to have a voice really and, and type in any questions you've got. And what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll try and answer as many questions, um, type them in, ask anything, um, you know, from, from the decision making bit through to much more technical finance. Um, just type them in and let's see what we've got. So question number one, because we've had a couple of questions that have come in during um, the webinar so far, so we can start with those and work our way down. But as Mark said, if you have any more questions, now's your time to, to type away. So just, question just, one. Before, we, just yeah? before we start, and, and McKellen, yeah, and uh, my German shepherd always looks up every time you say cat, yeah. I'm so <laughs> sorry if, if, you, if your dog's <laughs> gone nuts during this. Uh, my dog as well, kind of every time I, I look up and I say cat, he's kind of like, where? So I, I totally get what you're talking about. Starting with the important ones there, I see. Yeah. Uh, the first question we have was from Peter VOS, who said uh, in response to the um, impact profitability diagram, is this similar to the urgent slash important matrix just a juxtaposition? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I know what you're talking about. The urgent slash important is Eisenhower. The Eisenhower matrix looks at, um, you know, the urgent important. Uh, I, I think this is, it, it, it's like any good management consultant, you always have a two by two grid up your sleeve. And I've just found it a, an incredibly useful tool to be able to have conversations with, with charities. And it's interesting, if you go back and you map out your services and you've got some in impact and you've got some in profitability and you've got some in this space and you've got others that are, um, you know, maybe even not really creating a, a lot of impact or a lot of profit, if it's well spread out, it looks very healthy. Yeah. And that diversity, that differentiation makes a difference. So, so, you know, just getting your products and mapping them out and looking on that diagram will make a difference, Peter. Um, we've had a few people asking uh, or saying that they've had connection difficulties or just asking, will the webinar be um, available later? So the webinar is being recorded um, just to let everyone know that and it will be put up onto the MKS website probably next week. Um, uh, additionally, we will be sending an email around, as I said before, and the, the slides will be going with that. So you'll still be able to access the slides because we have a bunch of um, hyperlinks at the end that may be of interest to you as well. Um, we've got a question here from Avery who says, do you have any views on legacy cash flows as many organizations like us will have up to 50% of their reserves tied up in legacy accruals? We're predicting zero legacy cash flow before January 2021 and subject to audit providing against probate values because of the impact on asset values. Wow. Um, there's, there's one hell of a question. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 legacy values and, and legacy cash flows are going to be impacted in three ways. One, um, you know, it's going to take longer at the moment to actually do valuations and probate. That's going to that's going to push out the amount of time before you see your money. Um, you know, the second thing is um, stock market valuations. If there's any you know investments within that, maybe that that's that's gone down. Depends on when the um, you know the the actual assets were were uh, you know sold um, or if they were sold at all. But I but I but I really see that um, legacy cash flows will be pushed out. I I, I would have thought over three to, let's say three to six months. I mean, I, I, if Dan could type into the into the script here, or if Dan can join us just to give his view, Dan's our fundraising you know, expert, I, I'd welcome that. But I, but I think legacies, and, and if, you, if you look at legacies, I mean, it, it's a very large proportion of a lot of charities' you know, income. I think legacies will be pushed out, I, I'd say a good three to six months. I hope that helps, you know, Avery. Um, I can I can unmute Dan if if he has something to add or wants to join the conversation. There you go, Dan. You're able to talk now. Muted. Yeah, uh, um, legacy income is is challenging at the moment because um, because of all the things there that, that Avery mentions, um, and whilst 
it will come at some point. Um, legacies that are due to charities, that there will be a pause. Um, it, it may be more to, to the end of this year, um, just because there's things slowing down in terms of, of um, the probate process and um, the ability of um, lawyers to 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 man manage that process uh, due, due to the restrictions we have on, on, on how and where we work at the moment, plus the challenges in terms of selling properties. A lot of legacies are related to, to, to property and obviously we can't sell properties at this point in time. So um, yeah, money is locked up um, in, 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 in legacies. I've, I've heard some, some reports of charities that were expecting legacy income to come in during March because a lot of it had already been processed um, prior to coronavirus and, and, and some of that has, has been put on hold. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it is challenging um, at the moment for charities that are dependent on, on legacy inflows. Um, there's not an awful lot that, that can be done apart from acknowledging that and um, so sort of working out cash flow uh, accordingly. Um, that said as well, it is, it is a time that it is worth um, not, um, well, it's difficult what sort of legacy message um, charities should put out at the moment in terms of um, it's not a great time to be asking people to leave money in their wills for charities. Uh, however, in some other ways, it is it is a good time to be um, talking about that in in a in a um, an appropriate in in a, in a gentle and, and respectful way. Because uh, whilst we're in a situation where we're perhaps um, better informed about our our mortality than 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 we have been for 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 many um, decades, it's a time when people need to actually think about making sure their affairs are in order um, and making sure that their their wills say the things that they want their wills to say and that they, their wills prioritize their family, their friends and and any charities that they might want to put into into those wills. So um, it is also something that, that that charities could think about at this point in time in terms of, of making sure that their their legacy ask is is appropriate to the, the current environment but um uh, but 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 is is there uh, as, as well while we've got you on the line here mm -hmm. dan um we've got another another message here from kate who says what i'm going to put you on the spot here yeah, what where, are the where, actual where... steps to access the government funding for charities yesterday Yes. Um, that also is not straightforward. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say it was all, 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 all spin and no substance because uh, that would be unfair. But um, half of the funding, the government says it's don't call us, we'll call you, essentially. Um, whether that's funding that was already uh, designated for particular charitable organizations and is being restructured or, 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 or sent in different ways is, is still a little bit unclear. Um, but for um, organizations like hospices, like domestic abuse charities, like uh, um, St. John Ambulance that was mentioned, um, the, the, the government is, is saying that, that, that our government departments will find a way to, sense, to let you know how the money is coming through. Um, and the other funding is going to be coming through the, the bulk of the funding is coming through the uh, National Lottery Community Fund. Um, I don't think that they have a program ready yet to distribute that, but that's something they're obviously going to be working on very quickly. So yeah, can't hang on to the NLCF website um, on a regular basis. That's that was the funding that was directed to more of the, the smaller charities, um, more regionally based charities. I think the main message I got from the Chancellor's uh, talk yesterday was that um, when the Ch BBC Children in Need and Comic Relief do their big night in next Wednesday, or was it the Wednesday after 23rd, isn't it? Or, or in a couple of weeks, um, that's the time for lots of people to give as much as they can and for institutional donors to give as much as they can because every every pound they give will be matched by by the government. Um, government said it's uh, starting at 20 million, but uh, if larger institutional donors were able to, to give uh, millions um, at that point in time, then that would help the government to give millions as well to the charity sector and maybe get closer to that 4.2 billion that Mark mentioned right at the, right at the beginning of this, um, help to, to bridge that gap between the 750 million and, and the amount that would really help charities. In, in, interestingly, it might help some on the call that where you've actually had um, 
you know, cancelled events, you've had cancelled tickets, cancelled, uh, you know, marathons, cancelled, uh, you know, uh, where people were actually paying donations to take part as well. Um, the government is, is, is saying that gift aid may well be applicable and is going to, to open up the scheme uh, to enable gift aid to be claimed on those. Um, I, I'm seeing that from the, from the tax group or the charity tax group. Um, so, so I mean, you know, from the, from from the macro, which is the big amounts of money, to the micro, there's all sorts can do. Can can I just add that the, the two, two other things on on that? Um, hopefully, the government funding will maybe alleviate some of the pressure on a lot of the other grant makers and and um, and and other funds that are uh, emergency funds that are out there. Um, the, the CAF fund that you mentioned, Mark, um, was was heavily oversubscribed. Other funds are being heavily oversubscribed. I think the Martin Lewis um, uh, money supermarket one was was had 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 you know, thousands to thousands of charities want, want, wanting funding from that. Hopefully, the 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 750 million will will start to alleviate some of the pressure on those funds um, and make it easier for charities that aren't eligible under the government funding to be able to access some of these these other funds that are out there. Um, but I've also seen some reports to say that, that some corporate supporters of charities have pulled back their corporate funding because they've seen the government funding and saying actually that those charities are, are sorted. Uh, so they don't need the corporate funding after all, um, which sadly isn't the case and is is a, a mistake for, for, from those those businesses. Um, so something to watch out. And uh, I think somebody on, on the questions emphasised the importance of talking to your donors, particularly about existing funds that they that they promised and staying in touch with them. The emphasis is very much keep that dialogue open. Uh, you don't want to be losing funding that might get, be taken away from you because of a misunderstanding like that. So I'm I'm just going to I'm just going to grab I mean Dan thank you I'm just going to grab hold of two very quick questions um Susanna Herbert um I run a tiny charity currently I give 40% of my salary back to the charity would it be better just to simply take a salary cut um I I I I feel passionately that charities should recall the real cost uh, that means that actually if you just don't take your salary it's not showing the real cost of what it costs you to be the, the chief executive. Yeah, I think take your salary, pay the 40% back. It then means that you're reporting transparently. Without that, you're not. Um, Joe Turner, um, regarding management information, do you recommend a core set that a charity, a charity can amend? A absolutely. Um, we will try and find something between Marcus and I, which we can we can release in let's say the next week, ten days, that would be a core set. Um, you know, you should look at income and expenditure. You could you should look at reserves. Uh, you should look at cash flow. You should look at something that drives your organisation, um, and you should also look at some of the other things um, that sit behind that. Yeah. So, for example, recharge of of, of costs. That would be that would be one part of it. Secondly, you need to look at balance sheet and the balance sheet items. That's what I would recommend, if you like, as a as a basic set of, of management information. Uh, Marcus, we've uh, we've got one more minute left. Is there a question that you wanted to quickly um, answer, or shall I wrap it up? What just quickly going back through. Um, and I, I suppose. That, yep. Sorry. Carry on. No, I was going to say, I suppose, you know, what I what I haven't said is that we're happy to do 30 minute um, consultors, you know, consultation um, mm -hmm. conversations. So if anybody hasn't had their, um, you know, their question answered, like, for example, Steve, Steve Mann, please, please just pick up the phone, give me a call. We've given our details at the end here. Let's set up a time and we, we can help you with the with the question that you've got. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry Marcus. Was, was no, go for it. I, I think most of the questions that are left are ones that will probably take a little bit more time to answer. Um, so people such as Carl Richardson, we will we will get round to your questions. Um, it's likely to, to take rather more time to answer. So we'll we'll do that either within our email or we'll try and contact you separately. So it, it, it just I've moved it on to the last slide now to, to just say thank you all of you who, who bared with us on, uh, you know, a, a Good Friday, well, the Thursday before Good Friday. So so you have a great Easter break when you get to it. Um, I've given uh, the last slide here with Marcus, what's on the horizon, lots of events coming up, stay connected. 
Um, Carl, Penny, who, who haven't had a chance to talk, Emma, the other members of the team, um, we re really feel it's you know, passionate that we want to support the sector at the moment. We'll continue to have these webinars. Um, you know, the next webinar is 23rd of April at 4 p.m. We're going to try and keep that slot. Um, of course, we've got lots going on. Uh, bid writing, cost recovery, impact engagement, fundraising support, please, if we can help you do. Um, regular articles are coming out on the right-hand side here. You've got some of the articles from Dan, you know, from, from myself, the webinar that was, was done by Dan, but also the impact webinar, if we can get that up there as well, um, so that we're, we're enabling people to just, just really learn. 30-minute um, clinic slots for anybody that you want to talk to, so finance, fundraising, and impact. And uh, down the bottom, just an email address there that you can you can catch us at. Um, we're one minute over, Marcus. We, we, we've done really badly. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And, and, I'm, and I'm also really, really sorry for the black and white cat story. Um, That's okay. I'm sure you'll be forgiven. With, with all seriousness, you, you are just, um, you know, providing great support to uh you know the the charity sector at the time of coronavirus um and helping so many people that that don't have the opportunity or or, or or really need your help at the moment so so a huge and profound thank you um thank you very much indeed be good see you after easter thank you thank you everyone um we will be send, sending an email out next week as a as a follow-up to this with these slides all of those links you can see at the end you'll be able to click them to to follow them through thank you very much and have a lovely easter Bye-bye.